thank you guys for coming today. And thank you, dear Lucas, for the wonderful um, introduction. Um, as he said, what I'm going to be talking about today is stealth assessment in games uh, to measure and support learning. This is learning of important 21st century competencies. Um, so there's three main claims that I'm going to be making related to games, learning and assessment. The first claim related to games is that um, well-designed games can really act as transformative learning environments to support the development of skills across a, a wide range of important educational areas and also support uh, meaningful learning. The second claim, which is related to learning, is that learning is at its absolute best when it's active, when it's goal oriented, when it's contextualized and when it's interesting. And turns out those are the um, features of good games and it's also good instructional design. And the final claim related to assessment um, is that stealth assessment can be used to gather real time evidence of learning during gameplay. And then that could be used to make inferences about um, competencies at various grain sizes, which in turn could be used um, to support learning. So, um, what are games in a nutshell? Probably. The best definition of games that I know comes from uh, Bernard Suits in 1979, who defined a game as unnecessary obstacles that we choose to overcome. Um, so you can think of the game of golf, for example, where uh, the goal is very simple, get a ball into a hole. But in, you know, in real life, you would just pick up the ball and put it in the hole. But it's the rules of golf, along with the various challenges and obstacles that make it very difficult and all the more compelling or engaging. Um, like you have to stand and hit the ball using a club on the end of a stick go 200 yards and so forth with sand traps and so on. So when I talk about games um, in the rest of my presentation, I'm gonna be referring to digital games, which include games played on uh, gaming consoles, on computers and on uh, mo mobile devices. Okay. Um. So why consider, why use games as assessments? Um, there's a lot of reasons. Two main ones are that good games are very engaging. Um, you know, consider, you know, assessments, old school kind of assessments like taking tests and surveys. Um, those are super boring, but good games are engaging and they require a player to actually apply the knowledge and skills to succeed in the game. And they're also ubiquitous. Pretty much everybody, um, you know, all kids, boys, girls, uh, all countries, lots of countries play video games. Um, so it makes them really ideal as a, a venue for um, an, an assessment. So now digital games can differ on a lot of different dimensions, like the genre of the game, the content, the platform, etc. But good games, I contend, um, are a system and they consist of these six elements right here. Uh, the first one is interactive problem solving, and this represents the kind of ongoing interaction between the player and the game and the player in the game. And this is usually involving really interesting uh, problems that the uh, player has to solve. The next is good games have specific goals and rules. Uh, this helps the player focus on what to do, when and how. Good games have adaptive challenges, which represents the balance between the difficulty levels uh, in the game and the player's current ability levels. And the best games kind of hover right at the outer edges of doability. Uh, good games offer control um, to the player, control of the gameplay, the environment, the learning experience. Um, this one's really important as we know, uh, ongoing feedback is hugely important to learning and good games provide such ongoing feedback about their performance and um, they can provide support as needed. And finally, uh, good games have sensory stimuli, which is the combination of graphics and sounds and storyline that um, serve to excite the senses. So when, when all these elements come together, 
uh, in a game, this produces a very engaging and almost magical kind of experience where people want to play and replay a game and solve really hard problems because reaching goals is such a highly rewarding uh, experience. Um, now, the hard part is of this whole effort is to try to figure out how to create valid assessments within good games or any other kinds of immersive learning environments without mucking up the fun factor. And that's where stealth assessment comes in. Um, you, everybody's heard of the phrase chocolate covered broccoli. Those are games that are you know, educational, um, but they're not any fun at all. And we didn't want to do anything like that um, because kids can smell a crappy game a mile away. So let's talk about stealth assessment. This is the classic flow chart that I present for the stealth assessment cycle. And the way it works is a kid or kids are playing a game and they're producing all sorts of performance data, which is captured in the log file and then automatically analyzed by the stealth assessment machinery with um, in-game rubrics right here, then the results are output to the student model uh, at any time in any grain size. And then these current estimates about the competency levels um, can be used to provide feedback and other kinds of support in real time to the player um, during gameplay and round and round it goes and they play more, um, more levels and more data are captured and so on. So that's the basic cycle. Um, some of the features of stealth assessment are as follows. Um, since I came up with the term as well as the concept, these are these have remained in place for about, um, about 20 years now. I want stealth assessment to be seamless and ubiquitous. Um, and by seamless, I mean that um, the assessment is woven deeply into the learning of the game environment, and this blurs the distinction between learning and assessment. And by ubiquitous, I mean that is available and running at any and all times. Um, next, I very much intend the stealth assessment to be formative as opposed to summative. Um, so it's intended to help students learn, not just serve as judge and jury at the very end of a um, uh, course or something. And finally, it's um, it provides valid and comprehensive learner models because the underlying underlying models are built with something called evidence centered design, which is a key feature of uh, stealth assessment. And so here's a very uh, short but important um, image here about evidence centered design. This is formulated by Bob Levy, Linda Steinberg, and Russell Allman circa 2020 years ago. Um, so there's two main foci of ECD. It provides a way to reason about assessment design, how to create excellent assessments. And it also provides a way to reason about student performance. So when you go left to right, it, um, the ECD process begins by defining three main models. So any really good assessment starts by articulating, what the heck do I want to measure? What, it, what is it that, um, what are the knowledge and the skills and the dispositions and so forth that I want to say about a particular person? Um, so it involves identifying and structuring all the relevant uh, theoretical variables. Um, next is the evidence model right here. This involves establishing specific relationships between those theoretical variables and their associated metrics. This is how you're going to measure them. Um, and finally, there's the task or the action model. And this involves defining the specific features of tasks that'll uh, allow you to elicit the evidence that you need to inform the competency models. So in operation, in order for us to be able to diagnose students' performance, what happens is say a student has um, just solved a level in a game or they didn't solve it, but they, um, they do a series of actions or behaviors in the game. That's this yellow box right here. And then, 
that information is immediately sent at the end of the level to the evidence model, which immediately parses and scores these. So these are observables or measurable data right here, the blue boxes. And then these scored data observables are statistically linked back up to their theoretical variables. And then those theoretical updated, vari those updated variables are then reinserted back into the bigger competency model, which in turn um, uh, updates all of its, all of its uh, information per node. And it lets you know how well or poorly a person is doing uh, across the whole span of constructs in question. So um, I'm going to put this in context now. Um, uh, in terms of a game that we developed, we started working on this 2010-ish. Um, we've got support from the Gates Foundation, NSF, IES, a number of different institutions. Um, and I'll show you the team. I retired last year. Uh, but this was the team. I was the PI on um, most of the grants, all of the grants. Russell Allman, Feng Feng Kerr, Ryan Baker, Sydney DeMello, Lucas, <laughs> and other people too. Uh, it was a wonderful team um, and we got a lot done. So the game itself um, is a, it's a computer-based game with 2D physics simulations for things like gravity, mass, uh, potential and kinetic energy, transfer momentum, and so forth. Um, and the goal across all the levels, um, we typically tested, you know, 100, 150 levels in any kind of study, but we had unlimited levels because we also had a level editor built into the game. So um, the goal was to guide a green ball from a starting point to hit a red balloon. Um, and everything in the game obeyed the basic rules of physics. Um, we ended up creating two different types of levels. The first couple versions of the game only had a sketching interface. And this was where a person would draw objects on the screen using their mouse or some kind of stylus um, and colored markers that came to life when drawn to solve the problem. Um, and in the process, they would be inventing um, uh, simple machines like ramps and pendulums and, and, and springboards and so forth. And then uh, a couple of years into it, we decided that we needed additional types of levels called manipulation levels. And here, uh, a person is manipulating sliders in order to change uh, different physics parameters like mass and gravity and, uh, and uh, air resistance and so forth. So the thing is that players can solve problems in lots and lots of different ways. Um, and I'll show you, I think the next slide is a video. So I'm, I'm not sure if I have the sound on or not. So I apologize if you don't hear the music in the background, uh, but it starts with, um, it starts with, it'll start with, I think uh, some sketching levels and it shows some manipulation levels. So here a person, Needs to, the ball is falling, you know, gravity is pulling the ball down and the task is to get the green ball and go back up and hit the red balloon. And to accomplish that, the person successfully drew a pendulum over on the left side. Here, a person is drawing a lever using the uh, shark's torso fit as a fulcrum. Uh, lots and lots, like I said, we had so much fun. Uh, Lucas developed some of my favorite levels. This is an example of a manipulation level. It starts out um, with the problem, you know, acting in, in, in the in environment. And then the person manipulates um, the various sliders to solve the level. I don't think we need to show any more. Okay, so um, I hope... I, I can't see you all, but I hope you don't have any questions. Um, all right, so here's the competency model that I mentioned earlier. This is the first step in any assessment is what I can say I'm measuring physics or creativity or persistence, but talk is cheap. What exactly am I measuring? So in this case, 
this is the sum of everything that we are measuring. So we are interested in uh, force and motion, linear momentum, energy and torque, and each one of these broke down into several topics. So Newton's first, second, and third law of force and motion, properties and conservation of momentum, energy can transfer and dissipate, properties of torque, and static equilibrium. Um, so these were our focal, focal nine topics. And then each one of these topics, we developed about uh, 10 game levels, um, more than 10 game levels per topic um, that targeted those particular topic, topic areas. Um, all right, so how, um, now we're talking about the evidence model. Um, how does the computer score stuff that goes on? A lot of stuff is real straightforward. You know, the duration on a level, whether they solved it or not, that's real basic stuff. Um, but what's hard is like in the sketching levels, um, how in the world does the computer know? Because everybody draws differently. I can draw a pendulum one way, like with just a stick, somebody else could draw a club and so forth. How in the world does the, the computer make inferences about what it is that person drew? And I'll show you an example of how we came up with that. Um, so you're not expected to be able to read this. This is some uh, a snapshot of the log file. Here's a simpler version of it at a sim at a level level, where you've got oops, um, sorry, you've got one problem here is the diving board level. Um, they spent. 149 seconds on it, so a little over two minutes. Um, they ended up solving the level, but check this out right here. Uh, this agent vector, agent is what we used for a uh, simple machine. So this is saying at timestamp 61.78, the person drew a springboard, then at times, and they failed. Then at timestamp 98.08, they drew another springboard and so forth. How in the world does the computer know that they, um, they drew a springboard? Um, so again, you're not expected to be able to see this, but we worked with three subject matter experts. These were people that had PhDs in physics. Um, and we had a big two-day meeting with the physics experts down in Florida where we brainstormed, how are we going to be able to tell what it is that people are drawing? And we had been talking about computer vision and all sorts of things. So we realized, wait a second, there's a simple solution here. Um, because each one of these has, each one of these ramp, lever, pendulum, and springboard has a, um, has a particular feature, a unique feature. So let me show you, I'll make this large here for you. Um, for example, a pendulum, there's two different phases. There's a soft hypothesis phase where if these conditions hold, the computer says, hmm, I think the person is drawing a pendulum here. So the object has a single pin, the object is rotated more than 20 degrees, and it has non-zero rotational velocity. And then if this condition holds, the computer goes, yes, this is a pendulum. And we um, actually found that there is like 98 percent correlation between what the computer said that a person had drawn and what a human said, which was really um, very positive. All right, so as far as the evidence model, so we have that automated scoring set up for everything, and that's contained in the log file. Now, um, and that's what I was just talking about, um, we need to establish the rubrics in order to score all the raw data. Um, and here's some examples, the time to solve a level, objects that were drawn, sliders adjusted, and so forth. Um, then next, we need to establish cut scores. Um, to see the frequency distribution of indicators. So if a student, you know, across two days solves only 20 levels, is that good? Is that high? Is that medium or low? Well, a frequency distribution would show you that, you know, 20 levels is kind of on the low end of things. And this, is, this gets more and more reliable the more data that you have to feed into it. And finally, in terms of uh, evidence uh, accumulation, during gameplay, um, data per indicator feeds into the base net. And we have, for each level, we have a single base net. And here's some examples here where we've got 
physics understanding. So for any particular level, we know what the targeted competencies are being being um, being tapped, and then we know what the particular indicators are that um, need to be calculated. So um, I kind of like the simplicity of steps. Um, I set up the 10 steps to conduct stealth assessment. Um, I forget, I, I, this was published like in 2021, 22, I think. I'll, I can find a link if anybody's interested. Um, but like I said, step one is to create a competency model of the targeted knowledge, skills, and other attributes. Um, and this usually takes the form of, um, you know, co conducting a big, thorough literature review and then an expert review of your literature review. Second is to select the game. Um, and this can involve either selecting or creating uh, a game in which to embed the stealth assessment. Um, number three is to summarize a full list of the relevant gameplay actions or indicators. And this comprises the evidence that's needed to inform the competency model um, and its associated factor, fa facets. Number four is uh, once the indicators are specified, we need to be able to create new tasks to target um, all the indicators as necessary. Remember, I mentioned that we had to come up with the um, manipulation tasks in physics playground to accommodate those. Um, number five is to create something called a Q matrix. Um, and these are uh, a list of all the different levels with their associated indicators by skills. And this allows us to connect the indicators, um, both positive and negative, to the various facets. Um, step six is determine the scoring rules for the indicators. Um, again, those are the rubrics. And they can be discrete categories like, you know, yes, no, or... Uh, poor, okay, good, very good. Um, and it has to do with the relative uh, quality of the actions. Uh, next, number seven is the evidence accumulation, which is the real important. This establishes the statistical relationships between the indicators and the current level um, of the CM variables, the competency model variables. And we've been using BayesNets to accumulate the incoming uh, data and update the beliefs uh, regarding the competency levels, but you could also just use weighted tallies. Um, um, number eight is to pilot test your evidence accumulation or your base nets. Um, this will provide good priors for the targeted population uh, in terms of the competencies. Uh, next, after you've done all that, is to run validation studies first. Um, and then uh, the support of learning studies. And finally, use uh, real-time estimates as the basis for delivering adaptive supports. And this is cognitive and affective supports. Uh, and let's see. And here's a picture of some of the learning supports that we developed for physics playground. So I'm not gonna go into all this, but what I want to point out here is that we developed a whole lot of different cognitive and affective supports. And in all cases, we didn't want it to be boring. We didn't want to have a person disengaged from the gameplay environment. So that was kind of a common theme was it, it, our learning supports would not involve any talking heads. They had to be fun, you know, part of the spirit of the gameplay in the engaging environment. So. Um, some cognitive supports were things like game support, giving worked examples and hints as needed. Some physics supports were things like physics videos, animations, a glossary of terms, affective supports. Um, you know, if a person is not paying attention or they're feeling confused or angry or, you know, um, or frustrated, then that's going to affect their learning. So the affective supports uh, sense if a person, you know, has some affective issues and then has some supports associated with that. But again, like I said, I'm just going to focus on one 
um, particular physics support in the context of a study that we re we did a couple of years ago. And I will present the results of that right now. So um, this is an example of the one of the physics videos. And all of the physics, so each one of those nine uh, topics that I showed you in the competency model, each one of them had a number of different um, learning supports, physics videos associated with it. So all of the physics videos were about were the same. They were short, no more than a minute long, and they were carefully designed using first principles of instruction and first principles of multimedia. They were also um, created in the context of the game itself, so it felt very familiar. So learning was very comfortable for it. So it took what the students were learning uh, intuitively in the game and kind of formalized it with, look, this is this is what's going on here and this is what it means. So I'll show you an example here. Here um, you're going to see how to transfer energy. And to again, I'm not sure if you all can hear. The, Gravitational um, potential energy or GPE the is the energy of height. The ball begins with no height, so it has no GPE. The object has lots of height, so it has lots of GPE. Energy can change forms. The object lost GPE as it fell, but it gained kinetic energy as it sped up. Kinetic energy, or Ke, is the energy of motion. Energy can transfer from one object to another. The ball gained GPE, it gained height, and it gained Ke. It's now moving. Okay, so again, here you're going to see, here you're all right, so um, let me tell you about this one of many, many, many studies that we've done with Physics Playground. Um, here's a QR code for this particular paper. Uh, here's a URL for it. This was done uh, right before COVID hit. So we're still in the schools at this time. And then right after this study is when everything everything shut down but in this study we tested 263 kids these were ninth to 11th graders um, we tested them in their science class across six days and they had about four hours of gameplay um, the levels that they played were sketching and manipulation levels there was 91 levels total that they played they had a full set of um, learning those were the cognitive supports I showed earlier, including the, um, the oops, sorry, the physics videos. Um, we had a physics pretest and post test to see if any learning went on after, you know, as a function of the gameplay. And we also had a game and learning support questionnaire given to see if they liked the game, if they liked the learning supports, if they didn't like it, and so forth. So, now let's talk about the study. These are the different research questions, and these are in order of importance. Um, the first one has to do with the psychometric qualities of the stealth assessment. Are these stealth assessment measures reliable? Are they valid? And are they fair? You can't look at learning or anything else if you don't have solid, psychometrically sound uh, measures. Uh, the second question uh, had to do with learning and enjoyment. Do kids overall learn any physics from playing the game? And uh, did they enjoy the game? Um, both very important questions. And the third question had to do with the learning supports. Which of the eight learning supports most effectively enhanced learning uh, and game performance? So let's see what the answers are here. Um, starting with the first question having to do with reliability. Um, the first thing we had to do was look at the reliability of the external measure. We found that our ex our pre-tests and our post-tests were both were all uh, satisfactory. I'll show you what the external measures look like. These were based, this is um, what they did. These were all delivered online as well. Um, but these were based on something called the force concept inventory, which targets the same chunk of physics content that we were looking at here. Um, so our external measures were reliable. Our stealth assessment measures um, 
were also reliable. We measured them three different ways. So we computed a confirmatory factor analysis where we looked at gold coins. That was excellent solutions by each one of the simple machines, ramp, lever, pendulum, and springboard. And we found that the fit was very good and the air was very small. So that was encouraging. Uh, we computed an intra-class correlation um, and that was delightfully high. And finally, we computed a Chromebacks Alpha of the stealth assessments where we identified 110 cases um, that solved the same uh, exact same levels. And we found that to be 0.87. So it seems like our estimates are reliable, which is good. Um, now, ouch, ouch. In terms of the um, stealth assessment estimates, uh, for the validity, we had our in-game estimates, you know, um, at, at, in terms of, you know, the overall estimate as well as the facets, force in motion, and then the, and, and then the um, linear momentum, energy, and torque. And what we saw was that, yes, in fact, our stealth assessment es estimates significantly correlated with our pre-test and our post-test scores. And then our force in motion correlated with the force in motion items on the pre-test and post-test and so on. So these two were very encouraging in that, you know, we say we're measuring this stuff in, in the game. And in fact, it correlates significantly with the external uh, measures. Um, in terms of fairness, um, uh, the other psychometric quality, um, we had the same number of males and females uh, with a wide range of ethnicities. And um, in terms of learning by gender, um, we computed an analysis of covariance with the post-test as the dependent variable, gender as the independent variable, and pre-test score as the covariate. And what we found was that males tended to come in with higher physics scores than females, but at the end of the day, the results showed no significant outcome differences by gender holding pretest constant, which was wonderful because uh, so often, you know, you hear that boys do better than, gay, than girls on games and stuff like that. So there is no gender um, uh, effects which addresses a fairness issue. And additionally, with ethnicity, um, we computed another analysis of covariance with post-test as the dependent variable ethnicity as the independent variable pre-test the covariate. And again, our white students actually started out with higher pre-test scores, but the results at the end after playing the game showed no significant outcome differences by ethnicity holding pre-test constant, which was really, really encouraging. I was really happy uh, about those findings there. Okay, and uh, what about learning and enjoyment? So overall, students scored significantly higher on the post-test than on the pre-test um, after gameplay. Uh, a control group which did not play the game showed no pre to post-test difference whatsoever. In terms of enjoyment, students really enjoyed the game. This was on a one to five scale where one is hated it and five is loved it. And overall students uh, enjoyed it uh, with a mean of 4.03. Males and females enjoyed it equally and whites, blacks and Hispanics enjoyed it equally as well. Um, See. Okay, so learning supports. Um, we asked the students what their favorite supports were, and they reported that, you know, viewing hints, viewing the physics videos, and the worked examples were their favorites. Um, the worked examples actually showed them how to solve a particular level. Um, so that's kind of, it was kind of a cheat, but, um, and then we looked at what predicted learning? So we know what they like, but what actually predicted learning? So we computed a regression analysis uh, with post-test as the dependent variable and pre-test and then all the eight cognitive support frequencies in the equation and only pre-test and the physics videos uh, significantly predicted the outcome, which was 
very interesting. Um, and also those who watch more physics videos did much better in the game than those that watched fewer videos uh, did better in terms of the number of levels they completed, the number of gold coins that they got and so forth. Um, and this final point here really shocked me, to be honest, um, because it's really hard to uh, incorporate a seamless kind of support, but we seem to have done it. Um, so our supports do not, or the physics video supports, do not take away from the fun of the game. So it turns out students who watched more physics videos actually reported higher levels of enjoyment than those that watched fewer fewer videos. So that was um, shocking and wonderful, actually. Okay, so I think we're kind of wind, winding things up now. Um, a bonus question that you might have is, um, can this stealth assessment stuff be used in existing games to measure students' abilities, or do you have to develop a game from scratch? Uh, yourself? And the answer is, yeah, sure, stealth assessment can be used in uh, commercial games. Uh, what's hard, though, is you have to ha get access to the source code, which is a non-trivial issue in a lot of games. But um, some examples of stealth assessment that we've done in commercial games, um, the first is this game called Oblivion, Elder Scroll 4, I think. Um, and this was uh, our first stealth assessment proof of concept where we were measuring creative problem solving as a function of stuff that the person did in the game. Uh, we used Bayesness to accumulate the es estimates. And then I have a link to the, um, to the paper that describes the results here. Um, we did um, another really stupid yet lots of fun game called Plants vs. Zombies 2. Um, we measured problem solving skills. We were able to get the source code from EA, Electronic Arts, via uh, the Glass Lab. And we had to set up you know, our te telemetry in the game because it didn't capture the things that we needed. Um, and we validated the stealth assessment to an external measure in this, um, in this example here. We worked with a company, um, Tricium, up in Texas. Uh, they had a game to measure calculus uh, knowledge, and we validated the stealth assessment measure that we created in the game with an existing uh, calculus test, and that's reported here. Um, we looked at Portal 2 uh, as far as measuring problem solving, spatial skills, and persistence uh, before and after the game as, as in terms of um, some of the actions that they did within the game, and that's reported in this paper here. Uh, World of Goo measured um, problem solving, causal reasoning, static equilibrium, and so forth. Uh, that paper is mentioned here. So stealth assessment can be included in existing commercial games um, to measure important competencies, but um, it's a lot, it, it, it's a trade-off because you have to get access, like I said, to the to the source code. All right, so where are we? Um, uh, current and next steps. Um, so I'm personally, I love games and I'm a fan of autonomy. I like to be able to move around freely in a game and I think most players do. Um, but the issue here is if you really want to facilitate learning, um, you've got to incorporate uh, learning supports. In the first couple versions, testings that we did, we had the supports available for students to access if they wanted. So it was under voluntary or student control. And what we found was that um, the supports did enhance learning, but students typically did not um, did not choose to use them. Um, they did so they didn't get adequate dosage of the supports um, to be very effective. So now our default is computer delivered. So if you're going to deliver the um, if the computer is going to deliver the supports, the question then becomes when. And you don't want to just bombard a person with learning supports because that'll truly muck with the 
fun factor. Um, so the issue here is the timing of support delivery. Should supports, one study that we just, um, this was ju just came out, uh, I think this year, should the supports be delivered before a, a game level, like an advanced organizer or after? Um, like for reflection and consolidation purposes. And there's arguments to be said for either one. And we currently tested this with about 146 subjects. And there is a tiny but not significant uh, advantage for after. Um, but uh, you can read the paper for more, more of the subtle details. Um, affective supports, we're currently finishing um, a study looking at any bang for the but any value added that the affective supports provide above and beyond the cognitive supports. Um, and we also um, are able to implement um, some in the game, some quick prediction models. We did this, this is reported in this paper here, who is likely to quit a level and the model itself has about 37 behavioral indicators and um, so some of the takeaways here has, um, are as follows. So the first one is, I believe most everything is teachable. Some things that you don't think are actually are. Um, things like spatial ability, creativity, empathy, collaborative problem solving, persistence, and so forth. So after perfecting the measurement of the competencies, I would argue that the focus should be on interventions to improve learning. Um, the second takeaway is that feed, um, one of the most important parts of learning, like I mentioned earlier, is feedback, but the type and the timing of feedback used is key. So more research is needed here. Um, make learning fun. So test anxiety is real and uh, engagement leads to learning and current standardized tests are very limited and also very anxiety producing. So consider using games as a much better approach for measuring what it is you want to measure um, and, you know, and support targeting um, targeted competencies. Um, and Let's see, number four is that theoretical foundation is key. So for both the measurement and the support of learning, um, it's, it's really important to develop competency models at the outset and then associated learning indicators in real-time scoring. Um, so using evidence-centered design for kind of a top-down approach. Then later exploratory methods can find additional learning indicators and together this top-down and bottom-up approaches can, um, can support learning. Um, the fifth takeaway is Bayesian networks. Um, I think that you know, a very effective way to measure estim uh, or estimate in real-time competency states is via uh, Bayes nets, and I've been using them since 1995. Um, measurements should be probabilistic and cumulative, not, you know, real simplistic black, white, pass, fail. Um, you may consider using tallies, which are simpler. Uh, in terms of psychometric qualities, uh, talk is cheap. Always validate your instruments if you want to make solid claims about learning. And finally, uh, em embrace principles of instruction and learning. Uh, when designing any learning supports in games or any kind of engaging environment, make sure that you pay attention to the first principles of instruction, that's Dave Merrill's work, multimedia, that's Rich Mayer's work, and motivation, that's John Keller's work. Um, and with that, I am done. All right. Thank you so much, Val. Um, this is wonderful, and I, I think you have presented a lot of things for us to chew on. Uh, actually, a, a personal fun fact, my very first course I took in the grad school was with, with Val. So this, and it was also an IAM, so this brought a lot of back memory back. Uh, but anyway, um, it's time for questions. Any um, questions, comments, thoughts in your mind? Um, and we have mics here over here. Um, so any questions? And you know what, if you think of questions later, uh, feel free to email me at vshoot at fsu.edu.
thank you, uh, Professor Schultz. It's really very exciting. I'm Nancy Law, and I absolutely enjoyed your talk. Um, what I would like, I mean, I have a lot of questions I would like to clarify more, but just to start with, I'm, I'm quite interested in um, the use of support uh, at appropriate times. Yeah. Um, and I have two questions first. One is you talk about effective support. And, but in this case, how do you detect a fact? Um, the way that we've measured affective, um, we, we did a study and um, Lucas can probably point, point you to it, um, or I, I can try to find it and put it in the chat window. But we've done it before where we actually used um, facial recognition software on the computer. So as they're playing the game and we can effectively, reliably measure things um, like five different affective states, joy or delight, frustration, confusion, anger, and something else. Um, so we can do that one way. And then we had self-report measures of affective states. And I hate that, that's, that's unreliable and it's, it's stupid. Um, but I do have papers on the uh, facial recognition software um, experiment that we did. Um, and also the Brompt protocol that was done by Ryan Baker, one of my uh, colleagues. Um, where you had people walk around and actually make observations of, of people in a ro round robin manner. So there's a number of different ways where you can determine um, affective state. The one that's probably most interesting is the facial recognition because that's part of the computer environment. So when somebody is excessively frustrated, um, that would require a different kind of intervention or a different kind of support than if somebody was just bored and kind of, you know, messing around in, in the environment and not paying attention to the levels. So we had different kinds of um, affective um, supports, like we had a secret store that they could go to if they were like, uh, disengaged. And there they could go and they could change the music in the game. They could change the ball color. They could um, do a number of different things. Uh, and then they would come back to the game and they would be, you know, refreshed afterwards. Did that make sense? Makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, can I ask another follow-up question yes. in terms yeah. of support? Um, so now you were ask, uh, you were talking about um, giving support before or after the level. Yeah, and that's a very interesting um, question. And I'm just yeah, you should read the read the paper. Yes, I will. Yeah, yeah. but I'm 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 curious. Say, eh? would support be given? Can support be given as a reward? So that means, say, um, if someone has done something, okay, um, the. Um, we cheer the student and say, Hello. yeah, well, yeah. Then, we do. Then... Yeah, I think I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, but the reason I'm kind of squishing my eyes like that is because um, it, 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 it would seem more like it was part of an incentive system. The, the game itself does have an incentive system where they are rewarded for things and uh, disincentivized for other things. Um, it costs money, for example, now to uh, look at a worked example. But I think my reaction to supports being a, uh, a favor, a favor thing, you know, to be given for, um, for a bonus is that I think everybody needs supports and shouldn't be just given as a reward. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. But I'm also not saying that, you know, um, support is only given as a reward, but, you know, it could be a reward. Then um, could it be more attractive to the student to, to see it? Of course, it can be other things, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, That's a good question. I mean, I it, I think you should pursue this as a research topic. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh huh. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, please, Ali. Uh, thank you, Professor Shuti. I'm a PhD student, and my name is Ali. I really like the idea of you mentioning giving support before and after the game. My question is, how about providing support during the gameplay? 
I mean, it could be uh, because students. Oh, that's that's where it is. It's during the game. Oh, you mean in the formative manner, like if a student is struggling, then instead yeah, of quitting, that's... then so you give the support uh, right immediately as a prompt. Is that is the support what you mean, like giving after the game, or is it after no, the no, end no. Of the level? It, oh. So you were saying game, um, a ga for me, game is the whole thing. And a level is you have a hundred different levels to solve. Yes. So say you have, um, and sometimes we order the topics, you know, so we'll start with Newton's first laws, you know, and, and then Newton's second law and so forth. Um, but um, so we have different supports for different things. And if you have an upcoming level of like Newton's first law and you have a support related to it, like good instructional practice is to, um, you know, what's historically, I guess in 1965, been called uh, an advanced organizer. And this is saying, hey, what you're going to see has to do with, you know, Newton's first law, and it's about this and blah. And so it gets the brain primed and in that sense. Um, and so that makes sense that, before, and then they go and they play the level. I think it would be too a uh, obtrusive or um, too clumsy to have a uh, uh, support show up as a person is within the level because you don't know as a person is in the level if they're going to solve it or not solve it, you see. So, so it, okay, so can it be in the form of a scaffold? Like many times, you know, you know teachers that, yeah. are like a direction givers. So while playing the game, instead of the support can be the answer, it can be the direction to the answer, uh, perhaps. Yeah. The students uh -huh. can, you know, and, and that, strategy. Yeah. Yes, it's, and that's what we called hints. So I, I, I went through the slides really quickly, but there was physics videos and there was also hints and that was the scaffolding. It didn't provide the answer. It was like, think about so, something that's similar to it or something, but that that's good. And in fact, um, I'm not sure if you remember, but um, as far as what the students like, they really like the hints and the physics videos. So there is a place for it. Although when I looked at the prediction of learning, hints did diddly squat. They had no effect whatsoever on predicting learning or gameplay. Yeah, so, uh, but good you. question. Thank you so thank much. You. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Uh, well, uh, if we do not have any more questions, uh, then uh, I think the session is about to end, and uh, I know it's almost uh, uh, 10 p.m. for you, so we won't um, ask for more of your, your night time. And uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us, and Val has already graciously provided the, 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 uh, the PowerPoint slides and also the, the, uh, the email address, so feel free to ask more questions if you want more interactions. Um, so, well, thank you so much, Professor Shute, um, and thank let's you. give her another round of applause.